even if you only drive it a couple of feet, there's nothing <laughs> like a Rolls Royce. Jesus Christ is on his way back. And Jesus Christ comes again and every eye will see him when he come again. It's like anybody can be a preacher nowadays. Hey, smart Christians, welcome back. When I was asked to, if I would just cover some of these preachers that are fairly popular today, not the celebrity preachers, not the celebrity pastors, though I've been asked to cover them, I've kind of held off on them, but I'm talking about the ones that people tend to like, tend to appreciate, the John MacArthur's of the world, the Bodie Bauckham's of the world, the Justin Peters and, and Paul Washer's, the Tony Evans. I know some people may disagree with some of these people, but these are the ones that I was asked to kind of talk about and cover. One of the things that sticks out is the fact that they stick out. And it gives me in this video a chance to kind of cover not just those, but also some of the more infamous, some of the more celebrity pastor-ish uh, types out there, kind of compare the two. What is it about the good preachers that make them stick out and in comparison to these, what I would call bad preachers? There's a reason why they stick out. There's a reason why people even would cling to or go to a Vody Bauckham, a John MacArthur. Some of these preachers that are beloved, there's a reason why. It, it, in an ideal world, you would think that you would have thousands upon thousands of choices, and you do, but once you want to look for a sound preacher, a sound teacher, there should be an unending list. You would think there would be, but for some strange reason, sound preaching, sound teaching seems to be more and more uh, disappearing. But for some reason, there seems to be a lack of good, strong, sound, biblical teaching and preaching. Paul kind of alludes to this in 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 19, he talks about that there are these divisions, but he's highlighting some of the bad ones and saying that it's kind of necessary, though that that the ones that are the good ones, those that are proved, might be evident, might be shown. And so one of the things that happens is when you see so many bad preachers, so many teachers, so many guys who are supposedly in the ministry doing and behaving in such a way, it makes it easier to see and to notice the good ones. The problem in the church today, and really I would say even in America, stems from a lack of good leadership from the pulpit. But what do you think the greatest threat is to the church in our generation? It's pastors. <laughs> Honestly. The pastors. Anywhere, God has given three offices, I believe, to the church. Evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Wherever you see a weak church, you see these weak men. Either they're non-existent, they're unbiblical, or they're unconverted. And all this talk about the judgment on our country because of its immoralities and everything else, never forget judgment always begins with the household of God. And um, I am astounded at the lack of the fear of the Lord and the lack of biblical knowledge among those who would call themselves the ministers of Christ. And so in this regard, Paul Washer is correct. There's an old saying that says, a mist in the pulpit creates a fog in the pews. When someone in the pulpit has it wrong, uh, for whatever reason, it muddies up and muddles up and messes up what's happening out in the pews. So if you don't have a leader, a preacher, who is capable at handling the scriptures, um, but also who is strong, then you're gonna have that kind of carry over in the pool in, in the pews and when it leaves out into the community and so when you see some of these preachers the ones that are that are becoming more beloved one thing that you'll notice about a lot of them is that they're not necessarily the best orators they're not necessarily the the most gifted in speaking there are many gifted preachers those who are just adept at speaking 
who can dazzle a crowd and, and get folks in an uproar, uh, but they're just wrong. They're just off. And when they go off, because they've gotten folks in this excited fervor, they lead people in the wrong direction as well. Some of these men, the MacArthur's and Bacham's, the Peters and Lawson's and Washer's, and, and some of these other men, they're not necessarily the most knowledgeable out there. That's not to say that they're not knowledgeable, not to say that at all. But there are some men out there, I've met some men who know this Bible forwards and backwards, who, who could, who would actually, and I'm just being honest, who would cause some of these men that we, we have become to love, who would cause them to sit down and just to pay attention. There's some people who just, God has gifted them in the area of understanding the Bible, their knowledge of Hebrew and Greek and how it kind of comes together. And God has them in their area as well. And then you've got men out there who, and I'm not saying again that these men aren't knowledgeable because they are, but sometimes it's not necessarily those who are the most knowledgeable or those who are the most gifted at speaking. You want to be able to have at least some ability in both the ability to carry on a conversation, but also the ability to understand. You've got to be able to teach the word and understand the word. But that's not really the reason why they stick out. The reason why these men stick out is for one main reason. Again, their doctrine has to be solid. They do have to be able to convey their solid doctrine. But more than that, they have to be strong in their stance, not unwavering, not ready to shrink back because someone has opposed them or because someone is offended. Is that what I like to call the, the 11th commandment? The 11th commandment is thou shalt be nice. And we don't believe the other 10, right? And so th there are Christians who, if they see you engaging forcefully on an issue, let's say abortion, for example, you're engaged in a debate about abortion. And let's say that in your advocacy of a pro-life position, um, you, you, you are um, less than kind. They are more offended by you being less than kind in a debate about abortion than they are about babies being slaughtered in the womb. You cannot be a leader, a preacher, a teacher, if you are worried about people becoming offended. I had two pastors, two former pastors that can kind of illustrate this point. One pastor, y'all trust me, this man could probably run circles around 99.9% .9 of sound preachers out there. His understanding of the Bible and how it works together and then just to convey it. But I'll say this, where he struggled was his strength, his ability to stand up to people not as strong as he needed to be. And so because he wasn't as strong uh, and, and forceful of a leader, you saw that kind of carry over into the church and in the lives of the people who he, was, he, who he was leading. There was more chaos that needed to be if but for a shepherd who could kind of control uh, what was happening in the community. Then I compare that to another former pastor who doctrinally was nowhere near this other pastor but when you looked at how the church behaved and how people followed him this man was a strong leader what he you knew where he stood and where he was going he could look back and see the people following him he was a he was a courageous man he was a strong man he was he was a man of character and committed to uh, leading God's flock and so nowadays, you don't see that often. You see men ready to kind of kowtow and to bend at the pressure of the world because the world wants this ministry to be more inclusive. And I don't mean of people, but of any sort of doctrine that is not biblical, wants to be inclusive of anything that is not godly, of all types of sin, wanting us to be inclusive of uh, the homosexual agenda, wanting us to be inclusive of, of any social justice issue wanting us to be inclusive of anything that is not godly, but just causes us to be friendly with the world. Have you ever been to a house where you could tell there was no man, there no strong male presence in the house, and then you compare that to a house where there was a strong male presence? You can see how the wife was, how the children were. 
just the whole order of the house, the whole order of the place that everybody kind of had a direction. Maybe everything wasn't perfect, but still you can tell there was some peace there. There was some structure. There was some comfort there. First is a place where the man was either not there or just weak and, and, and you kind of see the difference. Well, the same holds true when it comes to the church. You need strong men who could help to kind of counter what's going on in the household as well as what's going on in the culture. And the only hope for stability and the only hope for sanity, the only hope for peace in a society is masculine, virtuous men. Evil abounds absolutely everywhere. How men respond to its presence determines the survival and well-being of a society. Let me say that again. Evil abounds everywhere. How men respond to its presence determines the survival and well-being of that society. No culture will ever rise above the character of its men. And when you compare the good preachers, the sound preachers, you compare them to some of these other men who, let's just be honest, they're weak. They are more interested in being popular than anything else. Their goal is to grow their budgets, grow their income, grow their fame, grow their status, grow their entire brand. That's kind of the main thing that they're looking for. When it comes to doctrine, they probably couldn't even spell it because it's not even what they're interested in. They're more interested in getting followers. Now, where they're leading them to, that's something altogether different. And so look at how some of these men have taken public stances on certain what they would call controversial issues. We don't consider them to be controversial because it's settled when it comes to what God has said. But when armed with the Bible and having a camera put in front of them, knowing that millions are watching, they tend to be a little bit more compromising, a little bit light on their conversation, not wanting to offend. Do you think, I'm assuming, uh, the LGBT community and the black church can coexist? Absolutely. Uh, how should the black church and the LGBT community exist? I think it's going to be diverse from church to church. Every church has a different opinion on the issue, and every gay person is different. And I think that to, to speak the church, the black church or white church or any kind of church you want to call it, are all the same is totally, totally not true. And all gay people are not the same. The, the, the types of relationships that are afforded are based on the types of people in each individual case. Yes. And LGBTs of wipes and sorts have to find a household of worship that reflects what your views are and what you believe like anybody else. Tony Evans of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. He is uh, an opponent of same-sex marriage, and we should point out he voted against Barack Obama in uh, 2008. The golden rule, we've all learned it, right, Reverend? Treat others the way you want to be treated. You're a Christian man. Does that resonate with you, what he said? Well, the golden rule resonates with me, but not to contradict other things Jesus said. And Jesus said in Matthew 19 that marriage is to be between one man and one woman. So you don't use that rule to skip his institution. Mm. God defines what marriage is. Society is supposed to implement his definition. When it creates new definitions, it creates chaos. The saga of a nation is the saga of its family's written large, and whoever owns the family owns the future. So we must fight for the family from a biblical standpoint, particularly if you say you're a Christian, Christ should have the last word. It's a non-negotiable. God has spoken on this issue and he hasn't stuttered. You know, there are two answers to every question. God's answer and everybody else's, and everybody else is wrong when they disagree with him. I'm not one of those that are out there to bash homosexuals and tell them that they're terrible people and all that. I mean, there are other sins in the Bible, too. And I think sometimes the church, and I don't mean this critically, but we focus on one issue or two issues, and there's plenty of other ones. So I don't believe his, uh, homosexuality is God's best for a person's life. I mean, sin means to miss the mark. But I don't believe being prideful or being, you know, lying or cheating. You don't normally talk about sin. I think I'm, I'm grown in my, my knowledge. I mean, those first interviews, I mean, this was all new to me. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't go to seminary. I wasn't raised, I was raised in this, but not in, on front of the camera. But I think this point, people say I don't, I don't talk about sin, but I do talk about how we live our life.
And homosexuality is and homosexuality, a sin. Homosexuality, yeah. Therefore, uh, it's a choice. It's a choice you make. It's a sinful choice. Did you choice. make a choice to be heterosexual? I, I don't think I had to make a choice to what be do you heterosexual. Mean? I think that's a natural Wait thing. A Wait a minute. In other words, one is a choice and one is not. Yeah. So he was unlucky because, and you're lucky. Because you're not talking about. Because it's natural to be heterosexual. That's what do you mean by natural. Well, yeah. I mean that's the way God made us. That's but the if normal. But he doesn't feel that way. What is he then? He's not a sinner. It wasn't his decision. Yeah, I think it was his decision. So it makes you wonder why would you even? Why are you in this? It clearly is not to uh, be a defender of the gospel. First Peter three fifteen is clearly foreign to them. They are not trying to defend the faith. Uh, in any way that I can tell or that really anyone with a biblical brain can see. And then you've got those who want you to feel good about what they're saying. They want to, they, they would much rather inspire you than to inform you. Obviously you want the word when it's given to inspire someone to do right, but the point is to give them the word and let God do what, what, what needs to be done. You want God's word, the spirit in you to do the working versus, ooh, pastor, ooh, preacher, that was a wonderful word. I don't know what you said, but it sure felt good. That's what you get from a lot of people, these sort of inspirational talks, these pep rallies. And you would like people to leave after hearing the word of God uh, more inspired. I think you will if you give them the truth and if you give them uh, in a confident manner. But what we've got are a bunch of people who just want to use these gimmicks to just try to be pleasing to people. Now, in many of your lives, that's what it feels like and that's what it sounds like. It sounds and feels like how am I out here and how I'm going to do what God asked me to do and what is going on in my life and I'm out here and it's dark now. History in the making. We in history in the making. Help me, everybody. Oh, oh. You standing in. Hey, history in. You say. Now give God praise for it right now. I mean, could you, could you imagine John MacArthur on a boat or up there dancing? Paul covers this when he's talking to Timothy, understanding the lay of the land, how it was then, and how it's going to be going forward. If you believe it's in you, there's nothing anybody can put on you that can cancel what I put in you. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nation. It just took the right rain to bring the seed out of the soil for what God put in you. And there's nobody that can leave my life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But, he says, you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Paul's point is, it's going to get bad. Folks are going to fall for anything, not only just fall for anything, go looking for it because they want to have their ears tickled. They want to have uh, someone tell them what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear. Like going to a doctor. Yeah, I know I've got cancer, but that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear you tell me everything's going to be all right, that I can just think my way out of this. And so you have pastors, preachers who teach this. But he says, convince, reprove, rebuke. Those aren't necessarily nice terms to rebuke someone. That means at some point in time, you got to tell somebody that's not right. You are wrong. You got to convince some folks, as he says, with all long suffering. Why? Because we don't get things the first go around. Oftentimes it takes us many times to kind of get it through our thick skulls. Right. Uh, the point of it is we need to kind of convince folks to show people what this Bible is about, to take to take a strong stance in what it's saying and not back down. 
he says, do the work of an evangelist. And in doing so, he says, you're going to have to endure affliction. People are going to come after you. I don't know what the, what the affliction is going to be like. It might be physical. It might be emotional. It might be financial. Who knows? But there is going to be uh, people turning their attention on you, most notably the enemy. If you do your job correctly, you are going to get attacked. But when you see how even in the face of, let's say, this pandemic, you've got a pastor like John MacArthur saying, no, I'm not backing down. We are going to exercise our right uh, to have church. We received a letter with a threat that we could be fined or I could go to jail for a maximum of uh, six months. Of course, you know, my, my biblical hero, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Apostle Paul. And when he went into a town, he didn't ask what the hotel was like. He asked what the jail was like because he knew that's where he was going to spend his time. <laughs> so um, I don't mind being a little apostolic if they want to tuck me in a jail. I'm open for a jail ministry. I've done a lot of other ministries and haven't had the opportunity to do that one. So bring it on. And so while some may agree or disagree, what you have to admire is the courage of his conviction. What you have to admire in a Vody Bauckham, in a, uh, a Tony Evans, in a Paul Washer, in a Justin Peters, in these men, what you have to admire is their conviction. You may not disagree. You may disagree with them. But what you're not going to find is that they're coming from some sort of ulterior motives as to where they are just trying to build their brand up. In many cases, some of the older pastors, some of the older preachers, they don't really care about their brand. It is what it is at their age. But then you've got some folks who are, who are my age, a little bit younger, who are not trying to reach this level of fame and fortune. They're just trying to be uh, received um, by God in what they're doing. So now two things. One, it's sad that good men like these would even stand out. It should be that the men who, you know what I'm talking about, it should be that the Mike Todds, the Stephen Furtick's, the Joe Olsteins, the, the, the Benny Hens of the world, the Copelands, that these men should be the, the, uh, the exception as opposed to the norm. They should be the ones that stick out, but more and more, they become more the mainstream and what's good and godly has become kind of the, hey, that's kind of rare to see. But what needs to happen is, rather than promoting these clowns uh, as though there's a circus in town, we need to go and one, call out these, these people and warn others from them. There are an awful lot of good preachers out there still. They may not have the large churches. They may not have the, the, uh, the big backing and so forth. You may not be able to find them on YouTube, but there are some strong godly men. Maybe some of them are by vocation. Some of these men may have another job, but there are still some men, as he said to Elijah, there's still 7,000 men who have not bailed their, been their knee to, to bail. And so there's a lot of men out there that are doing it. Our job uh, is to go out and find them and to promote them and to celebrate them. Let them know that they are appreciated. So if you do have a pastor or a preacher who is godly, who is rooted in the word, then let them know. So let them know that you appreciate him. Uh, let others know about him as well. If you've got a friend who's involved in one of these churches or one of these teachers that you just see that's ungodly, you do the work also of an evangelist. You be who, who Paul was talking to. Granted, he's talking to, to Timothy, uh, a pastor, but that means that you can't do the same work to try to move folks away from something that's dangerous and in many cases might even become heretical. While we love to hear good sound preaching, let's make sure the good sound preachers know that we love to hear them. Amen.